key verse of Psalm 106 is verse 6. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. And it goes on here throughout the rest of the chapter to detail the national sin of the nation of Israel. It's a confession of national sin. When we come to verses 34 through 41, we discover that the people of Israel, the covenant people of God, compromised with the Word of God. One of the fruits of that compromise, and you need to hear this, this is really the main idea of this entire message, one of the fruits of the compromise of, with the Word of God is murder in your own children. And I'm talking to Christians, Amen. professing Christians, murdering your own children. I'm not talking figuratively, I'm talking literally, murdering your own children. How does the covenant people of God go from that favored position to sanctioning the murder of their own children? Verses 34 through 41 spell it out for us. These verses ought to sound an alarm bell in our hearts. Our compromise is not cute. It's not something that we should wink at or that God winks at. And God does not consider it to be a given in our lives when we compromise with the Word of God. Compromise amongst the people of God ends up in the murder of children by their own parents. I'll tell you a couple of stories to illustrate the truth of what I'm saying. For the last couple of months that we were in Fort Worth, we'd been going as a family to an abortion clinic in Fort Worth on South Las Vegas Trail. We joined three elderly men who've been doing abortion, uh, abortion clinic ministry for about 20 years, every day for 20 years. So we go there just to encourage them and be there with them and to, and to do what we can to lift up our voice against this evil that's on our society. So we hold up signs, we prayed, try to stop the cars as they come into the clinic parking lot so we can give them information where they can get free help to deliver their baby. We take about, I usually took about 20 minutes and preach about 15 feet from the door uh, to the street at that clinic. And the workers have testified in court that preachers can be heard in every room in that clinic. So all this is perfectly legal, and our right to be there has been upheld by the courts, continues to be upheld by the Fort Worth Police Department. So Brooks, the man who heads all this up, has told me a couple of stories, and I've seen some of these things as well. Back in July, a woman and her mother drove into the clinic, and Brooks pled with them not to kill their baby. They said that they are Christians, and that they know that abortion is murder. But they plan on asking for forgiveness later. Brooks shared with them about Matthew 7. You know, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons, do many mighty works? And Jesus says to them, Depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. That's the word of God. Here's what they said. We know that. And we're going to do it anyway. They're professing covenant people of God murdering their unborn baby. A while back, another woman stopped to talk with Brooks. Again, he pled with her. This time she said, I talked to my pastor about this, and he knows that I am here. He says it's okay. This isn't some liberal pastor. This isn't someone who denies the word of God. This is someone that if I told you his name, you would all instantly know who I'm talking about. Professing covenant people of God conspiring together to murder an unborn baby. It was reported on the evening news in Dallas in 2010 that a new abortion clinic opened in East Dallas. The TV reporter was surprised to discover that the abortionist is an ordained Baptist minister. He says that he knows what he is doing is killing, but that he prays for their souls as they ascend into heaven. He shrugged off what he's doing simply because he says, it's what I do. A professing minister of God murdering countless unborn babies. Folks, compromise kills. Compromise kills. And this isn't just something that I'm talking about out here on the periphery. Somewhere out there, folks, I'm talking to you all. I'm preaching to you. When you compromise in your life with the Word of God, you set the stage... You set the stage, you make the table, set the table for your family, for your children to eventually go out and follow your example and continue to compromise. And as they follow that route and they they fall into the false 
uh, the false worship of this society, the worship of self, eventually they, they could kill their kids. You, your children could kill your grandchildren, or you could end up killing your own children. So it wouldn't happen to me. I wouldn't do that. Psalm 106, verse 34. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the nations and learned their works. And they served their idols which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto demons, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and played the harlot in their doings. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against His people. Insomuch that He abhorred His own inheritance, and He gave them into the hand of the nations, and they that hated them ruled over them. Let's bow together in prayer. Oh God, would You speak today through Your Word? Would You speak today through Your Word? Pray that I would decrease, Lord, that you would increase and that you would just deal with our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There are three steps, or th- yeah, three steps towards this kind of thing happening. And the first step is in verses 34 through 36, and that's idolatry. Verse 34, idolatry. How does idolatry take place in the life of a covenant person of God? How is it that a Christian, someone who's walking with God, becomes an idol worshiper? It starts off with prideful disobedience. Verse 34, they did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them. God gave a very specific command to the covenant people of God. He said, go in there and wipe out those nations. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, he made it very clear. Go in there and kill every man, every woman, every child. Go in there and wipe out the entire nation. All these, the Canaanites, all of them, kill them all. Now we don't like the sound of that in our 21st century ears. We don't like the sound of that in our 21st century ears. And we start coming up with excuses trying to explain away God's behavior. If you preach on college campuses, you'll hear this kind of thing brought up all the time. If God is a loving God, why would He wipe out all these nations? Why would He command that to happen? God commanded it. God commanded it. How, how, does that, how, do, you, how do you reconcile that with a, with a loving God, is what they say. Here's the truth. God is God. He can do whatever He wants to do with what He created. He can do whatever He wants to do with the Canaanites. He can do whatever He wants to do with them all. And so He took ownership of the situation. And you look down through the archaeological evidence, and you look through their history, and those Canaanite folks were murdering their own babies. Those Canaanite folks were involved in all kinds of sexual sin. And God, the soul that sins, it shall die. The soul that sins, it shall die. It shall die. And God in His sovereignty said, wipe them out. Now, who knows why they didn't do it? You know, they, they fought, they compromised. They, they, but the bottom line is, it's prideful disobedience. Somewhere along the line, the people of Israel said, I know better than God. I'm more compassionate than God. I'm more relevant than God. You know, I'm more contextual than God. Whatever. They're, they were saying, I know better than God in this situation. I'm not going to do it. And they didn't do it. And they reaped the whirlwind. Prideful disobedience. They did not love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And folks, when we, obey, when we disobey the Word of God, it's not a slip. It's prideful disobedience. We have it in black and white. And we disobey God. And where's the head? Where's the head? Well, the Scripture will show us here where it heads. Verse 35, worldliness is the next step in, in this idolatry. They were mingled among the nations and learned their works. You know, one of the great themes of the Word of God is separation. One of the great themes of the Word of God is separation. As early as the book of Genesis. Uh, Jeff mentioned earlier about you know, Lot and Abram. You know, here we go. Here's, 
Where is Abram pitching his tent? Where is Lot pitching his tent? And it goes all through. All through there, you have separation as a theme. Nobody wants to talk about separation anymore, else it sounds like a fundamentalist. But the truth is, we are called to separate from sin. Amen. We're called to separate from idolatry. We're called to separate from that, and yet we don't. We don't. Let's be honest, we don't. How many we we watch the same things the world watches? We listen to the same things that the world listens to, and then we're surprised when our children end up going down that road. How how foolish can we be? How foolish can we be? We're surprised when our own hearts stray. Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes. We haven't done that. Too many times we compromise and we put things on our computer screens. We put things up there that we shouldn't be looking at. And then we go out and preach. This is wicked. This is evil. We do it. Folks, we need to, we need to come before God in brokenness. And say, oh God, I have sinned. And ask Him, oh God, would you give me the gift of repentance? Would you turn my heart? Would you do a work in my life? Would you turn me away from this prideful disobedience and this worldliness? Separate from the sin. Don't learn their works. John Calvin said this. He warns us here that nothing is more dangerous than associating with the ungodly. Because being more prone to follow vice than virtue, it cannot but be that the more conversant we are with corruption, the more widely it will spread. In such circumstances, the utmost care and caution are requisite, lest the wicked with whom we come into contact infect us by their spoiled morals, and particularly when there is danger of lapsing into idolatry to which we are all naturally prone. Folks, we are prone to idolatry. We are prone to it. And then we surround ourselves with idols and then we're surprised when we fall into it. Folks, we've got to do what the guys did in the Old Testament. The you know, godly kings, Josiah and the rest. You go to the high places and you burn it down. You burn it down in your own heart, in your own heart, in your own life. Prideful disobedience Worldliness, And then the third step towards idolatry, once you've gone those first two steps, is the active worship of false gods in verse 36. And they serve their idols which were a snare unto them. They serve their idols. It's a verb. It's an active word. They were actively serving these idols. They went from the periphery. They went from mingling amongst the nations. They went from the, the, disobedience, you know, the disobedience to the Word of God that probably didn't seem like a big deal to them at the time. And now here they are actively serving these idols and it was a snare unto them. In our society, we don't have the idols, the literal temples and things like that that they had back at that time. We don't have the literal household gods that they had back there at that time. We don't have all that, but we do have another idol. The idol that we worship is ourselves. Amen. People make money to spend it on their own pleasure. People you know, just go off and, and get involved in the hobbies that just become so consuming. They spend everything on that. That was my story before I became a Christian. Before I repented of my sin and became a true Christian. I thought I was a Christian. I was a pastor of a church. But I was not saved. Folks, this is active worship of false gods. This active service of self. Freudian psychology and narcissism has led us to this place of self-worship. And the natural consequence, when somebody becomes, worship, when they're worshiping themselves, they are God and they begin to act like it in their own mind. They begin to act like they can make decisions that only God can make. Things like life and death decisions. Folks, this is a natural consequence. This is not some leap. This is a natural consequence to disobedience and worldliness and the act of worship of false gods. It leads naturally to a place where you are willing to murder your own children so that you can get what you want. Because the God that you worship is the God that stares back at you from your mirror every morning. You. That's the altar that you worship at. That's the altar that this world worships at. And it happens amongst believers. It does. Let's be honest about this and not pretend that we're something we're not. 
Folks, it happens amongst us. Prideful disobedience, worldliness, actively worshiping false gods. It's idolatry. It's nothing else. Nothing more, nothing less. Steve Lawson said this preaching on this text. There's not one of us here who is strong enough to resist the world's allure in your own strength. Now, there's not one person here that can resist the stuff that's being piped into our homes in your own strength. So what's the, what's the solution? We'll pull the plug. Get the pipe out. And, and get into the Word. And get your heart aligned around the true and living God. And stop compromising, thinking you can separate things. Like Jeff was saying, I have this over here, I watch whatever show it is I watch on TV, and then I go back to the Word of God. Folks, that's compromise. I know I sound like a fundamentalist. No, it's fine. I don't care. Idolatry. The second step here in this, we talk about idolatry, now we come to murder of children, which is called abortion, in verses 37 through 39. Three characteristics of abortion. Verse 37. Yes, they sacrifice their sons and their daughters unto demons. The first characteristic of abortion is that it is demonic. Did he just say abortion is demonic? Yes. I just said abortion is demonic. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 16 and 17. It's worth looking at. Deuteronomy 32, verse 16. Talking about the same sort of situation here. They provoked him, provoked God to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto demons, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods who came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Okay, there's these false gods that are out there, and God reveals here in the Word of God that they're not just de- statues, but behind these false these items of false worship, there's a spiritual force, and they are demonic. Amen. Okay, they are demonic. And by the way, your self-worship is demonic. Amen. I'm not saying you're possessed by a demon. I'm saying it's demonically inspired, demonically driven by this world system that surrounds us. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 talks about the doctrines of demons. Mormonism is not just something Joseph Smith cooked up in his own head. It's something that was demonically inspired. Jehovah's Witnesses was not cooked up by a council. It was demonically inspired, folks. Demons are involved in false worship. Abortion is all part of this. It's part of the the worship that's taking place here in the context. And saying the murder of born children, this is the murder of babies in this context. The murder of small, innocent babies. Here, it's a demonic thing. It's demonic. Scripture says it right there. Right there. Second characteristic of abortion. Abortion preys on the most innocent among us. Now I understand I'm totally reformed. Okay, my my views of the doctrines of grace. Some people might look at me and say, well, he's not reformed enough, whatever, but um, on my view of the doctrines of grace, I, I hold to the doctrines of grace. And I believe that in original sin. I believe that when my son was in the womb that he was conceived in sin. And that, that he was that he's a sinner from birth. Okay, I understand that. But the Word of God is not contradicting itself here in verse 38 in the first part. And shed innocent blood. Innocent blood. The term in the Hebrew is talking, is talking almost like relative, relatively. Now, I know we don't like relativistic thinking as, uh, as preachers, street preachers. But hear me out. What it's talking about is comparing the... In the Hebrew, it's talking about this baby who is not guilty of the idolatry of its parents. It's not guilty of the idolatry of its parents. It's not guilty of the same sins as its parents. And it's innocent of those things. Of those things. So that's what, it, that's what it's saying when it's saying innocent blood. It refers to persons declared innocent, free, or exempt from charges or obligations. Specific charges or obligations. These babies are not guilty of the disobedience of their parents or their idolatry. Now, Bible scholars and archaeologists have done some research into this, what was happening back there during the time 
of, the, of these Israelites, the covenant people of God. And they'd fallen into the sin of worshiping a specific god, Molech. You can read about Molech in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. And there it describes uh, the people of Israel letting their sons and daughters pass through the fire. Pass through the fire. Uh, archaeologists discovered statues of Molech. And Molech was a brass idol that had his arms extended out like this. And they would heat this brass idol up until it was white hot. And then they would take the, the son or the daughter or the baby that was going to be sacrificed and place it squarely on the arms of the brass idol. And then there were other people there that were banging on drums or playing flutes to try to drown the screams out of the baby as it was being burnt alive, burnt to death on this brass idol. There's some debate amongst archaeologists whether those arms may have hinged and just dropped the baby down into the fire itself at some point. They're not sure exactly, but that's the gist of it. Now we look at that, we hear about that, and we're, we're repulsed by that, aren't we? We're repulsed by that. And it's repulsive. We ought to be repulsed by that. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 7 for a minute. There's a lot more about this idol worship and sacrificing of children in the Old Testament than what many of us even think about. But it's here throughout the Scriptures in the Old Testament. The covenant people of God sacrificing their children to demons. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31 says, They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be called Topheth, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they shall bury in Topheth, so there be no place. This valley is Topheth in the Old Testament. It's called the valley of the son of Hinnom. In the Greek, it's Gehenna. You see, when a society decides to murder the most innocent among them, you have unleashed hell on earth. Amen. You have unleashed hell on earth. And if you don't believe that, just go on Google and type in pictures of abortions. And you will see hell on earth. These innocent babies are being slaughtered. 53 million in the United States since Roe versus Wade. We are making Adolf Hitler look like a choir boy. 53 million in the United States. Folks, and they're we're doing it, they're doing it on the altar of convenience. Women give an average of almost four reasons why they are seeking an abortion when they go to an abortion clinic. The first, 21% say they don't have enough money to raise a child. 21% say they're not ready for the responsibility. Another 16% say um, her life would be changed too much by having this baby. 12% talk about problems with relationships or the fact that they're unmarried. 11% say, well, I'm too young, I'm too immature to have this child. Should have thought of that a little while before. 8% say, my children are grown, I have all that I want. Now there's a sad thing, when you go to an abortion clinic, you see a lady pull in, and she's got her children in the car seats in the back. But she's going in to murder the brother or sister. We've seen it. 3%, the baby might have health problems. Less than 1%, pregnancy caused by rape or incest. Less than 1%. So when you total this all up, 92% of the reasons why women have abortions has to do with convenience. Because who's God? They are. Amen. Abortion preys on the most innocent among us. God has, said, has set a very high bar regarding the slaughter of the innocents. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 25, hear the word of the Lord. What God says about this, Deuteronomy 27, verse 25, Cursed be he who takes reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed is the one who takes a reward, a bribe, money to slay someone who's innocent. And these doctors are getting paid anywhere from $350 to $1,200 a pop. This is big money. Big money. Folks, this is our nation. This is happening now. It's happening today. Amen. It's happening today. Abortion preys on the most innocent among us. And know this, abortion is a curse on a nation. Amen. Verse 38. 
last part of the verse, down to verse 39. The land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and played the harlot in their doings. Abortion is a curse on a nation. Innocent blood being shed in a nation is a curse on any nation. You can say, well, this is talking about Israel. This is talking about the people um, there. No, it's a curse on any nation. John Calvin said, It is an awful manifestation of God's vindictive wrath when the superstitious heathen, left to their own inventions, become hardened in deeds of horrid cruelty. This is God's wrath upon our nation. You say, where is God's judgment? We're cruising along just fine. Have you not been watching the news? Are you not paying any attention? Do you think that maybe 53 million uh, people paying into the system might put us in a little bit different financial situation than we're in right now? Amen. You know, maybe? I don't know. 53 million? Folks, come on. This is a curse on our nation. God, this abortion in and of itself is a curse on our nation. It is a judgment right. itself. It's a judgment itself on our nation. God has put on us a blindness and a stupidity where we don't even step up and speak out against this. And I'm not talking about the people, again, the humanitarians, the United Nations. No, I'm talking about the church. Amen. Where is the church? Where? Where's the church in this? Where's the church in this battle? Everybody, we look at it, we say, look, it's all the renegades that are out there preaching out the, outside the clinics. Why is that? Why is that? Where's the church? I want the church to be out there. I want to see them out there standing up for righteousness. Folks, it is not righteous that 50, we have slaughtered 53 million. It's not righteous. And we are guilty. Their blood is upon our hands because we know better and we've kept our mouth shut. For two reasons. Number one, it's political. It's political. I say that's hogwash. This is not political. This is moral. Amen. This is a moral issue. Yes, the politicians have grabbed a hold of it. They've taken ownership of it. And we've let them take ownership of it. We've been asleep at the wheel on this thing. We need to take it back. Amen. This is not political. It is moral. Reason number two why good, solid, reformed churches have not gotten involved in this fight. Because the Roman Catholics are in on it. Let's talk about the elephant that's in the room. That is why we, we don't get involved in that fight. Do you think the Catholics need to hear the Gospel? I'm not saying join hands with them. I'm not saying that. I'm saying go to the clinic. The Roman Catholics are there doing their thing, chanting their Hail Marys. We saw it the other day. It's ridiculous. Doing pagan worship, thinking that's going to somehow end this thing. It's not. Okay? But could you maybe go there and preach the Gospel? Amen. Could you go there and preach the Gospel? Oh, they won't like that. Well, the people in the clinic don't like it either. Go there and preach the Gospel. Preach the Gospel. Don't let the Catholics take this thing and run with it. Folks, stand up. Stand up. These Scriptures apply to us. The Word of God applies to us. Stand up and do something. It's a curse on this nation. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. He hates it. He hates it. His wrath is against it. Did you ever think we'd ha- see a day in our nation's history when we would see people talking about whether or not our nation was going to default on its payments? Did you ever think you'd see that in your lifetime? Did you ever think in your lifetime that you would see September 11th? I never thought I'd see anything like that on TV. Do you, is God sovereign over this stuff? It, it, oh, wait a minute. Now you're starting to sound like Pat Robertson. He was right. Well, listen, folks. God brings judgment. He's sovereign over the nations. God was not asleep that day. He was not asleep on September 11th. God was not asleep. He was not asleep when this nation is $14 trillion in debt. God was not asleep at Hurricane Katrina. He wasn't asleep on any of this stuff. He was active. Abortion is demonic. It preys among, on the most innocent among us and it is a curse on our nation. And woe be unto us if we sit silent. We will answer. We will answer. Know this. We will answer. We will answer for our silence. You know this is true. You know this is true. And then judgment comes. Verses 40 and 41. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against who? His people. Insomuch that 
He tolerated his own inheritance. Is that what it says? Insomuch that he winked at his own inheritance. He abhorred his own inheritance that engaged in this. This is the wrath of God unleashed against his people. To the degree, in verse 41, he gave them into the hand of the nations and they that hated them ruled over them. Think about that for a minute. What if God didn't with didn't give us mercy as a nation and he allowed those that hate us to rule over us what if Al Qaeda ran the United States look at this God's wing him God's wrath means that he intensely hates all sin that's what the wrath of God means we talk about the wrath of God but we don't want to apply it to ourselves A.W. Pink, the wrath of God is His eternal detestation of all unrighteousness. It is the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. It's the holiness of God stirred into activity against sin. Insurrectionists against God's government shall be made to know that God is the Lord. They shall be made to feel how great that majesty is which they despise and how dreadful is that threatened wrath which they so little regarded. William Gurnall, nothing is so sweet as the patience and goodness of God and nothing so terrible as His wrath when it takes fire. We have sowed to the wind and we are reaping the whirlwind. Now, at this point, I want to be very clear about something. Abortion has affected so many people in this nation that if you preach a message like this, you've got to be very aware that when you're preaching, there could be people sitting there listening to you that have been involved in this sin. Women that are... One out of three women that are, um, that are like 43 years old have had an abortion. One out of three. I'm aware of that. And I want to say this to you. Yes, the wrath of God is hot against the sins of our nation. And the wrath of God is even hot against individuals who have sinned in this way. But know this, Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. He has satisfied the wrath of God. If you are in Christ, and this is in your past, and you've repented of your sin, and you've placed your faith in Christ, know this, Jesus Christ has fully satisfied the wrath of God on your account. He bore that wrath. It pleased God to crush him, not you. Because God was gracious to you. So please know that. And if you're here today as an unbeliever, and you think, well, God can't forgive me. I've murdered my child. Don't listen to the lies. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He can separate your sin as far as the east is from the west and bury it in the deepest sea. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. God may yet pour out His full brunt of His wrath against this nation. But know this, your sins can be forgiven. Your sin can be... Christ Christ has dealt with the, the wrath of God if you are in Christ. Our nation has murdered more than 53 million since the Supreme Court decided that it was legal. Judgment is coming. It has already come, and it is here. So what do we do? First of all, we must repent. Like the men of God of old repented. Men like Daniel repented for the sins of the nation, even though he was not personally accountable for those sins. He hadn't done those things himself. And yet in Daniel chapter 9, what does he do? He says, we have sinned. We and our fathers, we have all sinned. And we have sinned. We need to do that. He recognized his part in their sin. When it comes to abortion, folks, listen to to what you've heard. We have lived in the same compromise that leads to it. Okay? So we have sinned. We have lived in the same compromise that leads to abortion. We have sinned. We need to repent. Okay? We have learned their works. We've mingled amongst them. People in our churches have murdered their babies. In some cases, they do it with the sanction of the church because we are identical to the world. We must repent of our compromise that teaches the youth in our church that idolatry and abortion are okay. Idolatry and abortion are okay. That's what we tend to think. 
And it's a compromise that leads to that. In the meantime, we have done nothing. Now, up until recently, I'm telling you the truth. I had done nothing. Up until recently. And I don't feel like I've done enough. Now, I know probably everyone in this room votes pro-life. I'm sure everyone here votes pro-life. But there is a difference between being pro-life and voting pro-life and trying to stop abortion. Think about it logically. Pro-life people have served as congressmen, senators, Supreme Court justices, and even as president. And yet, more than a million will die this year. So, being pro-life and voting pro-life, while it's good, and we should, it, does, it will not stop abortion, and it's not enough. Your, your responsibility does not end the day that you walk into a voting booth and, and pull a lever. That's not when your responsibility ends. Let me ask you this. Can you hold a sign? I'm not a big sign guy. I don't like sandwich boards and stuff like that usually. But I'll tell you something. When it comes to abortion, I have no problem holding a sign. I hold a sign of an aborted baby up to let people see it as they drive by. They need to know what's going on in those places. Can you hold a sign? Can you pray for the demise of the abortion clinic in your area? Every day. Dear God, shut down the clinic. Amen. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Gets the job done. Pray. God, shut it down. You know God's answered that prayer for a lot of people? Can you do that? Can you volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center? Can you ask your doctor if he's pro-life and if he's not, go find another doctor? Let it hit him in the pocket. Can you educate yourself? I'm not saying that everyone has to go to a clinic and stand outside and hold a sign and preach and all that. But what I am saying is that I think everyone, every Christian in this nation needs to ask themselves this question. It's a question that someone challenged me with. Are you willing to pray and ask God, God, what should I do? And then when He tells you, go do it. Are you willing to do that? You know, I, I, I listen to this guy, he's 77 years old, and he's looking me in the eye and he says, are you willing to do that? I said, I think I'll do that. <laughs> and we prayed, and the next thing you know, I'm out there with my family. And we're standing out there, and I see my, four, my five-year-old son yelling through a bullhorn, please don't kill your baby. And man, that, <laughs> that's priceless. It's priceless. And it's priceless when you see a woman come out of the clinic She goes in there with the intent to kill her baby. She goes in, she reads the stuff that you gave her, and even though the clinic workers are doing everything they can because money's walking out the door to try to get them to come back, she goes out anyway, and she says, I'm going to have my baby. (laughs) Glory to God. Now, that's not the end of the story. I know that. They need to be, they hear the gospel, repent, believe it. Yes, I know. But it has to start there. Proverbs, I'll close with, with this. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. Hear the word of the Lord. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I pray that this room full of people would simply come to a place where they go to you and that they would cry out to you and say, Oh God, what do you want me to do? And then go do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.